Good morning. Great to see you. This is a new song for us, so join in as soon as you can. Amen. Well, good morning. I am Kenny Lewis. I'm the worship pastor. It is so great to have you here worshiping with us. Let's continue to praise. Let's continue to sing. Take you at your word. Sing this with me. Is a lamp unto my feet, and your way is the only way for me. It's a narrow road that leads to life, but I'm on the own. It's a narrow road, but the mercy is wide, because you're good on the promise. Take you at your word. If you said it, I believe it. I see how good it was. If you started, you're completed. I'll take you at your word. You spoke in the 
chaos fell in All I know is I've seen it in my life It's a narrow road that leads to life But I want to be on It's a narrow road, the tide is high As you part of the water You said your love would never give up You said your grace is always enough You said your heart would never forget or forsake me You said I'm safe, you call me yours You said my future's full of your hope You never failed I know that you'll never fail me You said your love would never give up You said your grace is always enough You said your heart would never forget or forsake me You said I'm saved, you call me yours my future's full of your hope you never fail So I know that you'll never fail me I'll take you at your word If you said it, I'll believe it I see how good it works If you started, you'll complete it I'll take you at your word I believe I see how good it was You started to complete I'll take you at your word Cause you're good on your promise I was buried beneath my shame. Sing this with me. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my soul. Till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was not till I met you. You called my name. Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Your mercy 
Sing this with me. You are here. You are here. You're moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Sing that again. You are here. You are here. Moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. darkness, my God, that is who you are. Cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are.
promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is that is who you are, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Way make a miracle work. Promise keep a light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Cause you are way make a miracle work. Promise keep a light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 Way maker, miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you. Keep a light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Listen again, one more time. Cause you are way maker, miracle work. Promise, keep a light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Cause you are. Sing this with me. Waking up through a new sunrise, looking back from the other side. I can see now with open darkest water. Cause my brokenness brought me to you And these wounds are a storm So I'm thankful for the scars Cause without them I wouldn't know your heart And I know they'll always tell of who so forever I am thankful for the sky. Now I'm standing in confidence with the strength of the faithfulness. And I'm not who I was before. Don't have to 
So forever I am thankful for the sun. I can see, I can see how you delivered me. In your hands, in your feet, I found my victory. I can see, I can see how you delivered me. In your hands, in your feet, I found my victory. So I'm thankful for your son, cause without them I won't know your heart. And with my life I'll tell of who you are, so forever. Without them I would know your heart And I know they'll always tell of who you are So forever I am thankful for the stars So forever I am thankful for We've come to our time of communion this morning, and so if you're unfamiliar with how we do that, just look at the back of your bulletin. You'll find some instructions there. You know, Kenny, as I was, I was thinking about the song that we just th- sang, and that last line, it changes just, just a little bit, but it changes the course of uh, not only the song, but the outlook of what that means as we sing it. When we sing, I'm thankful for your scars. And I can't help but think of the book of the Revelation where it talks about Jesus as the lamb as if it had just been slain. Because we know that the scripture tells us that while we get a resurrected body, are, are you looking forward to that? To your, <laughs> wow, I think they're ready, Rick. The one person throughout eternity that is still marked by scars is our Lord Jesus. He's still bears the scars. And scars are hard, aren't they? Especially when we think of it in a, in a new way, when it's, it's not just the scars that we just receive in life because of either bad DNA or corrupted DNA or, or somebody else's corruption. Yeah, those scars hurt. But there's also the scars that happen because they do pass through a hand of providence and of love. We don't like that because scars, they hurt. They're ugly, aren't they? Have you ever had a wound that was itchy? Sometimes those scars itch. Sometimes when we look in the mirror, if you had chemo, your hair is growing back weird or you don't get any hair, right? Sometimes it it infects us or it affects us in ways that, well, we never, we sure don't like it. It's not... Not, not the plan that we had for our lives. But what if it was the plan that God allows? I'm not saying, Rick's going to talk about this later, but I'm not saying that God is the author of our problems. I am not saying that. But I'm saying that God can still use those things. And when we, when we think about communion, it's as if we are saying, Lord Jesus, I want to be like you. Isn't that what a disciple is supposed to do anyway? I want to be like you. And so when I take this wafer and I put it in the fruit of the vine into the juice, I want to identify with everything, not only the blessings, but also the blessings that look like it hurts. Because have you ever thought about this? Everything good that, that's happened in our lives, the really, really good things, most of them aren't, or the deepest lessons, I should put it this way, They didn't happen because they were pleasant, but because they were painful at the time. 
the really important lessons. I learned very little from the pleasure. I learned a lot from the pain. And so this morning, take that wafer, dip it in the fruit of the vine and say, Lord, I want to identify with you in every way. Father, we, we just remember that this morning as we just sang that song as our hearts desire. It may with great trembling say, I want everything, everything that you have for me, Lord. If it means I can identify with you, if it means I can bring a greater glory to you, I want that too. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Let's go ahead. Start at the front rows, make our way back.
Hey, do you ever find it increasingly difficult to, to navigate through this ever-changing, social media-driven world of teens? Well, hey, you're not alone. You know, but it feels like an uphill battle sometimes, doesn't it? I'm Mark Gregson of Parenting Today's Teens Radio and Podcast, and I want to tell you about an upcoming event called Engage 24. It's an online simulcast that's full of practical parenting help, and I would love for you to attend. Don't let the gray hair and gray mustache fool you. I've earned every one of them. And I've done so by living with 60 high school kids for the last 40 years. Over 3,000 kids and their families have been involved with us and we've learned quite a bit from all that time that we've spent helping kids through the most difficult of times. Fantastic, so mark that on your cards. Hey, good morning everybody. I'll tell you what, you just look beautiful. I'm just amongst beautiful people this morning. So I wonder if it'll, I hope it rubs off. That's all I got to say. Welcome to Grace Community Church. We're so glad that you're here this morning. So my name's Sean. I'm the Pastor Connection here. And we're just so grateful that you've come and, and come to worship. Hasn't it been great this morning so far? It's been awesome. So what a great, what a great way to start uh, the, the week. Okay, so, hey, everyone should have received a bulletin this morning, and inside that bulletin, you're going to find all kinds of information that you're going to want to know about, but one important card, if you'd please take this out, especially if you are a first-time member, or if you've never filled out, or excuse me, first-time guest, or if you've never filled out one before, and that's our connection card. Would you please take that out and fill that out for us? Um, if you're new to Grace, you matter to God, and therefore you matter to us, and we would love to have a proper record of your coming this morning. So please do us a favor and do that because if you give us your address, we want to give you a gift. So uh, keep that in mind, all right? And if you're a return guest, let us know who you are. I love to send out text messages appropriately. I love to send out text messages and just connect with you, especially if you might have a question about what happens here at Grace. And so I'll do my best not to give you a wrong answer. Uh, the other thing we want to use that, that card for is we would love it if uh, you'd let us know how we can pray for you. We know that, that everyone is going through struggles. We know that everyone could use some prayer. And so it's the privilege of, of the pastoral staff to take these cards, pray over every one of those cards. So let us know how we can pray with and for you. All right, well, it's time for our offering this morning. And this is just an opportunity for our members and our regular tenders to be able to give and so if you are a guest this morning, this, is, this doesn't apply to you. Um, so uh, this is just for the rest of us as we enter into the discipline of giving. You don't have to give unless you just want to. But uh, other than that, just enjoy today. And so let's pray. Father, as we, as we prepare for worship through the giving of, of our offering this morning to you, Lord, whether it's done on a check or, or a bill or a... a um, or using PayPal, whatever that works, uh, or push pay. Father, we, we just want you to know that someone told us the gospel, and therefore we want to be responsible for helping other people to know that the grace of Jesus enters into their life as well. He can turn their dust and ashes into glory. And so we ask that you would help us today. We dedicate this offering for that very, very measure. And we... we we dedicate it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Sean. Last Sunday evening, Sean and I had the great privilege of teaching our membership class, class 101. And well, we had a wonderful group. We had a great time. It is my privilege to introduce to you this morning 16 brand new members of the Grace family. So we're very excited about them. So I'm going to introduce them. Their pictures will be on the screen. And when we call your name, if you are at this service, come up. And uh, we have a new member back for you. Just remain standing until everyone has been introduced. We are, and the rest of us, let's give them a grip, big, big welcome. First of all, Jack Boucher. Jack Boucher, let's give it up for Jack. He was at the early hour. Ronna Bryant. Ronna Bryant. There's Ronna's picture, everybody. She was at first service. Mary Hicks and Annabelle. There's Mary Hicks and Annabelle, also at the early service. Carmen Lassiter. Carmen Lassiter, come on down. I think I saw Carmen. We're also welcoming Laura Mills Muir. Laura Mills Muir. Come on down. There's Laura. 
Ann Myers, come on down. There's a picture of Ann up there. Good, good, come on down. Mr. Alex Perez, come down. I saw you right here. Also welcoming Ray and Lila Sanchez. Ray and Lila, great to have you guys here. Ray's one of her bass players, you'll recognize him. Also welcoming Teresa Sanchez. Teresa Sanchez, come on down. Pedro Silvas and Arabella and Jodesai. Pedro, I think I saw Pedro, there's Pedro right there. Very good, come on down. And last but not least, Corey, Holt, Tilton, and Colby. There's Corey, everybody. And he was at the early hours. Wonderful to have all of you guys here. Let's give them a warm grace welcome, everybody. Yeah. Woohoo. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. You may be seated. Hey, and just remember, there's a new member luncheon in your honor immediately following this service in the children's building. It's going to be great food, great fellowship. Please, please join us for that. Class 201, Discovering Maturity, is next Sunday. If you have never completed the discovery classes, you've been to 101, here's your chance. Jump in, register on your connection card, if you would, please. Well, we are in the middle this last week. You had the opportunity of voting for our next senior pastor. We had Pastor Nate here last week. Hopefully you got the email uh, that we sent out earlier in the week. I was very excited just to have the unity uh, of, of all of our leadership. So the search team was unanimous in recommending him. The deacons re totally united 100%. The pastoral staff 100% that Pastor Nate is the next guy. So you've had the opportunity to vote. Deadline is today. Listen carefully, 1230. So after church, you have 30 minutes. Ballot boxes are at all three. I feel like an airline <laughs> steward. All three exits, there's a ballot box, ballot. And so if you are a member 18 years and older, you have the opportunity to vote. Thank you very much for doing that. Hey, do me a favor, stand up, say good morning. There's some great folks. They're all around you. Find one. Say hi. You guys are great. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have been greeted. You may be seated. Thanks. Some very, very wise person once said, you either have a problem, you are a problem, or you're married to a problem. <laughs> now we're going to study the book of Job, and the book of Job tells the story of a man who had a problem. And after you meet his wife, you may also say he is married to a problem. Some people read the book of Job and, and they conclude that his greatest problem was that he started out healthy, wealthy, and wise and then lost it all. However, upon closer examination, we're going to discover in this study, Job had a much deeper problem. In fact, he actually had a philosophical and a, and a theological problem problem, and he was struggling trying to reconcile this philosophical and theological issue. Now, what was his problem in a nutshell? Here it is, and I put it in your notes. Job's problem. He has a conflict between his theology and his experience. A conflict between his theology and his experience. So you think, what is theology? When you study the book of Job, you will soon discover he believed that God was good 
God was fair and God was just. That's what he believed. That was his theology about God. However, his experience, his experience, God is not treating him good or fair or just. And that was the conflict poor Job was wrestling with in his mind. Here's what he believed about God. But down here in real life, he wasn't experiencing what he believed. Job had to wrestle with this conflict between what he believed and what he experienced in life. Hmm. Can you already begin to identify with Job? Anybody here ever gone through a difficult time in your family or maybe a loved one? And you said that word, why God? You ever say that? God, why? Why did you let this happen? Why do, why do bad things happen to good people? And there's no reason. There's no, it looks like there's no rhyme or reason. There's no explanation. God, why do you let things happen? That's Job. And that's our lives as well. If you haven't already been there, you're going to be there. Something will happen in your life, around you, with your family, with your friends, in your job, with your finances, somewhere, you're going to have that moment where you go, God, why are you letting this happen? This makes no sense. It's that eternal conflict and issue of human suffering. Now, two basic explanations, and I realize this is very simplified, but two basic explanations have been offered through the centuries to solve Job's dilemma and explain the problem of human suffering. Okay, number one, the Greeks. The, the way Greeks explained human suffering was that there are two kinds of gods. You got your good gods and you got your bad gods. And you don't want to tick off the bad ones. Because if you tick off the bad gods, they're going to punish you. And, and the, the rain isn't going to come on your crop. And you're going to get sick, and your family's going to suffer. And that's the way the basic Greek mentality approached human suffering. Two kinds of gods don't make them mad. On the other hand, the Jews offered a different explanation. They said suffering is simply the result of sin. If you sin, you will suffer. And if you're suffering, it's because you sinned. Now, this was the, the basic understanding of human suffering when Jesus was on planet Earth, living in a very Jewish culture. That was what was the accepted norm of his world. And that's very interesting. Just a little side note here. The disciples of Jesus provide a great example of this kind of thinking, that if you sin, you're going to suffer. If you suffer... There's got to be a sin. We see it in John chapter 9. Just two verses, but you see this problem that Jesus had to deal with. John 9 verse 1. And he, Jesus, went along. He saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? Oh, you already see it, don't you? Okay, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. You see the problem. That was the basic understanding of human suffering in the Jewish world. A guy's blind, somebody sinned, either him or his parents. Now, we don't have time to today. But if you go home and read the rest of John chapter 9, it's really interesting how Jesus answers their question. See, they say, hey Jesus, is it A, he sinned, or is it B, his parents sinned? And Jesus says, C, none of the above. Matter of fact, it's to, to glorify God. But we can't go there. The book of Job. The book of Job offers a third explanation of human suffering. Not like the Greeks, not like the Jews. It teaches, it, it teaches that the, the Jewish Hebrew explanation is half true. Now, you know the problem with the half-truth. It's that other half. It's the half that's not true. Now, the half that is true 
sin does lead to suffering. We all know that. The Bible calls it the consequences of sin. The Bible says, a man reaps what he... You've heard that. A man reaps what he sows. So you, you rob a bank, you get caught, you go to jail, right? You re, you're going to reap what you sow, so if you break the law, you're going to pay for it. However, here's the problem. Not all suffering can be traced back to the sin of the sufferer. For example, some suffering is caused by the sins of other people, right? Not the person suffering. An example, a drunk driver uh, runs over and kills an innocent child. What, well, what, was, there, was that child sinning? What, were the, the child's parents somehow sinning and, and the drunk driver? No. We know sometimes we suffer not because we did something wrong, because somebody else did something wrong, and we have to pick up some of their collateral damage. We have to pay some of their stupid tax because another part of this is some suffering is caused simply because we live in a fallen world. Y'all have figured that one out, haven't you? We live in a fallen world where bad things happen to good people. Let me give you an example. Every single one of you in this room, let me be the first to tell you, you're going to die. It's true. Someday, don't know how, don't know when, someday you're going to die. Why? Because you did something wrong? No, because you live in a sinful, fallen world where bad things happen to good people. Now, the book of Job also offers another very important insight into human suffering that I believe will bring great relief if we will learn this lesson and internalize it. And it's a what if. What if God has a hidden purpose for your suffering? Hmm. What if God has a hidden purpose for your suffering that is never explained or understood by the sufferer? Some of you are going, I know some of those. I've got some of those pains. I've suffered, and I, and I still don't understand why. And there's no explanation. What if, what if God wants to teach the sufferer to trust him no matter what? Hmm. What if God has this great idea that he wants to teach his children to walk by faith, not by sight? And if he explained everything to us, and every time we suffered, if he gave us the reason why, then we would be walking by sight, right? Yeah, he'd explain, oh yeah, we get it now. What if God wants us to learn to walk by faith, not by sight, and to trust him no matter what? No matter what. We're 100%, 100% in, we're going to trust him no matter what. Well, welcome to our series, Where is God When It Hurts? Now, this four-week four, four study is obviously not going to be an exhaustive study of the 42 chapters of Job. Um, I got tickled several years ago. Pastor Chuck Swindoll did just that. He preached an exhaustive sermon series, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, all 42 chapters. I understand it took him a better part of a year just to get through it. On the final day of the series, when he announced to the congregation that today will be the final sermon on Job, the audience broke out in applause. <laughs> so, I, I promise I will spare you that pain. Our study is going to be four weeks. It's going to be an overview of this fascinating book. Now, here's what I want to encourage you to do. I would like to encourage you, you got four weeks, you have a month, Read through the book of Job on your own. Maybe find a, a good modern translation, even a paraphrase that might make it easier. But read through the entire book of Job this month. And what, we're, what you're going to do is don't get so bogged down in the weeds that you can't see the forest. 
our goal is to back away and look at the big lessons. What are the big principles that we need to learn about human suffering and about trusting God in the midst of that? Now, in your reading, let me give you a little heads up. The book of Job begins and ends with prose. Everything in the middle is poetry. Now, that's important because sometimes poetry can be a little bit difficult to understand. Some of the imagery is going to be a little bit different. Some of the metaphors, you know, you're going to be scratching your head, but that's okay. You're looking for the big lesson, the big principle. Our goal, here's our goal, guys. I'm praying that by the end of the four weeks, we will learn to accept that hidden purpose. That those times in our life when we go through suffering and we're experiencing pain and we don't know why. I want us to learn, even in the midst of those difficult, challenging, confusing, why God moments, that we can still say, God, I don't understand why, but I trust you. Don't understand why, but I'm putting my faith in you. Now, this journey begins when we understand what is behind the curtain of suffering. Now, I'll explain that, but I want you to imagine, okay, we're all out here, including me, and then right here behind me is a curtain. And on the other side of the curtain is God and what God is doing and what God is up to. Now, we're on this side of the curtain and we don't always know what's on the other side of that curtain unless God chooses to tell us and explain to us. But there's going to be a lot of things that God does on the other side of the curtain and we're over here going, why, 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 why? And God is basically saying, uh, none of your business. And we say, but I want to know. And God says, well, go create your own universe. You can set up your own rules. There's going to be things on the other side of the curtain that we don't understand. And Job is going to help us understand living on this side of the curtain. All right, let's dig into this. What do you do when, you do, when you're saying why? What's on the other side of the curtain of suffering? Number one, the first thing we must understand is Job's condition. Job's condition. Verse 1, the story begins. In the land of Uz, now immediately that's not Oz. Okay, that's a different story, different curtain. Uh, okay, okay, that's Oz, we're talking Uz. In the land of Uz, there lived a man named, whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. And he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays. And they, were, they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Now watch this. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangement for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, his kids, saying, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's, what? Regular custom. Now what do we know about Job's condition? I would say his spiritual condition was in good condition. Job is, Job is this all around good guy. He loves God. He loves his family, loves his kids. He hates evil, he shuns evil. His spiritual condition can be summarized in one word, one word, righteous. The guy's righteous. He's just a good, God-fearing, people-loving, family-loving guy. So we need to understand his condition. But then, uh, number two, we need to understand Job's problem. Job's problem, and he, he's got a problem. Here's where it all starts. Verse 6, 
One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. Okay, stop for a moment. All right, so we're no longer on this side of the curtain. Now we're on God's side of the curtain. We're in heaven, spiritual realm, okay, and on the other side of the curtain. The good news is we get to peek over the curtain because of the book of Job, all right? So one day the angels came, present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. What? What's he, what's he doing? In, it's on the other side of the curtain. I don't know. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? Uh, you've blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Question, what gets Job set up for all the suffering that is about to hit him? Is it because he is a sinner? Is it because he's committed some grave sin that he's going to be punished for? No. What gets him into trouble? It's his righteousness. The guy's so good. What gets him into trouble is God is showing him off to Satan. Going, yeah, you know, Satan, look at this guy. Boy, Job, he, he's one of my guys. He is solid. Job said, oh, yeah, but, you know, you take everything away and he'll curse you. God says, okay. Okay, now remember, we're on this side of the curtain. On the, on the other side of the curtain... God and Satan are cutting a deal. Does that bother you? Again, go create your own universe. And you can do whatever you want to behind your curtain. Wow. Third. Third, we need to understand Job's suffering. We need to understand Job's suffering. You guys remember where you were on 9-11? I remember exactly where I was standing when 9-11 when hit, when I saw it on TV. You will remember that our nation was hit four times on 9-11. The first World Trade Center went down, then the second tower, then the Pentagon, then the plane crash in Pennsylvania. We, hit, we got hit four times. Interesting, Job is hit four times with experiences of severe suffering. Let's look at these. Hit number one. You ready? Hit number one, Job's possessions. Job's possessions. So let's see what Satan did beginning in verse 13. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby. And the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tw tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and, and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. Man, when it rains, it pours. Lost all his possessions. Hit number one. Hit number two, Job's family. Job's family. Look what happens to his... By the way, how many kids did he have? You remember? Ten kids, what happens to them? Verse 18. 
while he was still speaking. Oh my goodness, there's no let up. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead. And I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. Good grief. I know some of you in this room, you've got that call in the middle of the night with bad news. How about four calls back to back? Unbelievable. So how is Job going to respond to these first two hits? Verses 20 to 22. At this, Job got up, tore his robes, and shaved his head. In that culture, that was a sign of grief and mourning. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. You know, we sing a song with those words, don't we? Is that a Chris Tomlin song? In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Wow. Two hits. Well, there's a second deal cut with God and Satan behind the curtain Hit number three, Job's health. Job's health. Look what happens next. Chapter 2, verse 1. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, <laughs> deja vu here, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, he's in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. That was hit number three. Hit number four is Job's wife. One verse says it all. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Whoa. Whoa. A little side note, before we criticize Job's wife too severely, just remember she just lost all of her possessions, buried her 10 children, and now has to watch her husband's health deteriorate right before her eyes. So, aren't you glad you came to church this morning? Aren't you, is everybody just encouraged and uplifted so far? You know what? This is real life, this is where we live. This is where we live. So how is Job going to respond to the, these hit number three and number four? Verse 10. He replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Amazing. Well, we have to leave Job today in this miserable condition but I want us to know as we begin this journey through Job, I want us to learn three, uh, excuse me, five great truths about human suffering. We're going to see it unfold in our reading and in our study of the book of Job. Five great truths. God, these are truths that we need to understand if we live in the real world. Now, if you create your own universe, you don't need these. But if you're going to live in this one, these are going to be very helpful the next time the bottom falls out 
and you're going, why God? We need to remember these great truths. You ready? Number one. Number one, Job is righteous and his suffering is not the result of his sin. We just saw that. In fact, his suffering can be traced back to his righteousness, not his sin. Job's problems all start when God is bragging to Satan about his great righteous servant Job. Behind the curtain, but that's where it all starts. Now, why is that important? We need to understand that when somebody is suffering, we can't walk up to them and say, or we can't even think, well, it must be sin in his life. She's got some hidden sin, otherwise she wouldn't be suffering. Watch out, that's dangerous. Number two, number two, Job's suffering is instigated by Satan, not God. Now, God allows suffering, obviously. He uses suffering to help us grow and mature, but he is not the author of suffering. Notice in our passage today, God even places limitations on suffering that he allows. This far, Satan, but no more. So when we suffer, it's very important. We need to accurately identify the culprit. It's Satan, not God. So, you know, when you're going through suffering, don't shake your fist and say, God, learn to say Satan. Satan is the author of suffering, so we need to give him the credit and don't give God the blame. Great truth number three. Uh, we're going to really see this one next week. Job's friends will draw the wrong conclusions about the cause of his suffering. We're going to meet Job's friends next week you know, with friends like that who needs enemies. They're going to come along. They're going to offer simplistic and superficial explanations for his suffering that are not true. They're not accurate. They're not correct. Now, why do we need to learn this? Because chances are very strong. Somebody in your realm of influence, a family member, a friend, is going to be going through some kind of suffering. Don't be like Job's friends. That's the last thing they need. So we're going to learn. Actually, next week we're going to learn how to be a friend, how not to be a friend to someone who is going through suffering. All right, number four. Number four, Job's suffering will eventually lead him to sin. Now, many people who study Job miss this point, but it's very true. Listen carefully. His sin does not lead to suffering, but his suffering does lead him to sin. You with me? His sin didn't cause the suffering, but once he starts suffering, then he starts sinning. What do I mean by that? You're going to see it over time. We're going to witness Job become proud, arrogant, self-righteous, demanding, even hateful toward God. You know what you call that? Sin. Now we know Job's sin because when you get to the end of the book, we see Job repent when he is eventually confronted by God. Why did Job have to repent at the end? Because he sinned. After he suffered, he got a really bad attitude and an arrogant, self-righteous attitude that God had to deal with. And then number five, and here's the big lesson that we all need to learn. God never explains to Job the reason for his suffering. Never does. I, hey guys, I read the whole book all the way to the last word. God never explains, you remember, what went on behind the curtain. He never goes, hey Job, come here. Come around, let, come around back here. Now let me explain this deal that Satan and I cut. Yeah, let me, God never does that. Now we the readers know the reason for his suffering because we get to hear the conversation and the deal being cut between God and Satan. Because we're the readers, we get, to, we get to see behind the curtain. Job never hears the conversation. He's left in the dark about the reason behind his suffering from start to finish. Why? Could it be that God's desire is that Job and we, the readers of his story, We'll learn a great lesson that we all need to learn in life. Trust God. Trust God. 
trust God in our suffering without demanding that God explain himself right now. And how many times have we had that attitude? God, you get down here right now and tell me why I'm going through this. By the way, have you noticed God doesn't jump when you say that? Yeah. We've got to learn to trust him. Well, there is, a, there is one truth that I know about every person in this room today and listening online. Uh, you either have a problem, you are a problem, or you're married to a problem. Welcome to life. This means we can all relate to the story of Job. This is why the book of Job is so relevant today, as much so as it was thousands of years ago when it was first written. And we today would be very wise, listen carefully, listen carefully to the story of Job. Learn from his experience, benefit from what we can learn by looking behind the curtain of suffering. Then, then the next time you uh, have a problem, are a problem, or are married to a problem, perhaps it won't be such a big problem. Let's pray. Well, Lord, uh, thank you for telling the story of Job. Thank you for letting us, at least at this point, peek behind the curtain of suffering. Even though Job never understood that something was going on behind the curtain, we can see it. Thank you for letting us see that. And Lord, when things are happening behind the curtain in our lives that we don't understand, we can't explain, Help us to trust that you are God, you have our best interest at heart, and you will somehow see us through. Remind us, Lord, that uh, we're on earth, not heaven. Heaven is coming someday, it'll be a great and glorious day, but until that day comes, may we learn to trust you in all things. We pray it through Christ. Amen.